And now, a special interview segment. The Heller Supreme Court decision, the man and the case that secured your Second Amendment rights. Please welcome your host, Emily Miller, and special guest, Dick Heller. Dick Heller. This is Dick Heller. Those of you who have heard of the Heller decision Supreme Court, this is Dick Heller. Thank you, thank you. It's a real man, right? A real dude. It's a real dude. He's a real dude. He is a dude. Um, we're great friends, and um, he has changed my life in the sense that I have the right and have a gun at home legally in the District of Columbia solely because of this man's fight. <laughs> Thank you. So Dick, Dick, take me back because people hear about the Heller decision, they don't realize it was one man who fought and fought and fought for so many years. Take me back to, I'm sure it was before I was born. 1976. <laughs> when you all started. I moved into Washington, D.C. in 1976, and three months, uh, about a couple of weeks later, I said, oh, uh, my favorite television program is Gunsmoke, and I like Matt Dillon Gun, so I went out and bought one because there, was no, there were no regulations, no restrictions. And so I bought that in July of 1976, and in October, the D.C. City Council passed a law that said you were no longer allowed to own any kind of a firearm in D.C., uh, but you could not buy one after that, but you could, grant, you could be grandfathered in by coming down to the police station and registering your firearm. And Think about that. That did not sound right to me. So I said, why would I want to register it? It's because they want my address. Why do they want my address? Because they want to come and get my gun and for confiscation. And I said, no. So I had some options. I could turn the gun in to the police station. I could throw it in the Dipsy dumpster or I could go to jail. So I took my gun out of the district to my brother's house and I said, there's gotta be a fourth option. And so that was that you had this gun and you saw that, and so for those of you who are from normal parts of the country, <laughs> I always have to explain it so people America. don't understand it. Yes. <laughs> um, there were, until Dick Heller fought this fight and won at the Supreme Court in 2008, and this is the 10th anniversary, and this is what we're celebrating here today, 10th anniversary of restoring our Second Amendment right to keep arms. <laughs> the man himself. It was illegal. They made it, again, obviously, unconstitutional, we now know, in D.C., in New York, in, in Chicago, in these liberal urban places, they actually made it illegal to own a gun. I'm not talking about carrying it, I'm talking about owning it at home for self-defense. And that's what he fought for. He fought for the right, the individual right to keep arms, and that's the Supreme Court decided in your case. So what did you do, how did you fight, how did, you get, how did your case get to the Supreme Court level? How many years did that take? When they took my right, my Second Amendment right away in 1976, I said, there is a Second Amendment right. Somehow I am allowed to own this firearm, but I didn't know anything about the law. I was just a computer programmer. Uh, so in 1976, I started doing research, talking to everybody I could over a period of time in the think tanks and getting ideas. And in 1993, we met some think tanks that sort of liked the idea. And a couple of us paired up and uh, we got some people to support us, and at the same time, the Cato Institute had the same idea, and we paired up, and eventually we had six plaintiffs that decided we're going to fight the city. We sued the city uh, in about, sometime, short time thereafter, um, and the rest, I don't remember the dates exactly, it's in the law books. That's boring, keep going. <laughs> Who so, you, the point when you, the, nobody, all of us, well, the lawyers are next. We'll let them do the oh, boring okay. stuff. 
we're focusing on you, the man. First of all, as you're telling the story, I never knew that you went to think tanks. I mean, how many of you go to think tanks to try to change laws and constitutional laws? What's a think I, tank, right? Right, exactly. Like you world. had to do all this research on your own, and then you got all these people. And like you said, like neither of us are lawyers. How did you, you don't even know about this? This case builds. People start coming to it, start supporting it, and it goes through. What was the first ruling that it had when you appealed and said, "I can't." own a gun, which the Constitution, Second Amendment, all of you who have your constitutions out, pull them out, Second Amendment, the right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, except in Washington, D.C. and other liberal cities. No, no, no. So when you, um, when you start getting the buildings case, what was the first decision that was made in the courts on your right to have a gun at home? Um, let's see. The first decision would have been in, uh, since it was a federal issue, a firearm constitutional issue, it was a federal case, it went to the federal, first, the, the D.C. District Court, it's called. And um, let's see, it was a struggle to get there, um, but the decisions flip-flop back and forth, and finally uh, we won in the appellate court, and D.C. said, we're going to challenge this, so. And by saying you won, you got to the appellate court, which as you all know, there's regionally around the country. The DC appellate court said you won, meaning DC cannot ban completely owning guns. And then DC, the mayor, said we're gonna appeal this to the Supreme Court. Exactly. And that was a tactical mistake, well known now by the DC mayor, city council, because it opened up, which a lot of people did not see coming, Supreme Court made a ruling in 2008 in the landmark Heller case that said what? The Supreme Court, uh, my favorite quote, there's a lot of stories, interesting stories to get to the Supreme Court, but my favorite story about the Supreme Court is that uh, I didn't know anything about the law, I didn't know how the decision might go, but when they announced that Justice Scalia was going to read the decision, and I like to, this is my quote. Here's what Scalia said. <coughs> we are not here today to erase the Second Amendment from the United States Constitution, unquote. <laughs> I didn't know anything, but I know we had won something. God rest and, his soul, Justice Scalia. <laughs> rest in peace. That's what he will be famous for forever. And... Uh, and what was it like? I've always, I've never asked you, we're very good friends, I've never asked you this, because you go to the Supreme Court and it is, I suggest anybody who's never been there, it's an amazing American experience to understand uh, that, because we don't get to see it on TV. When you're there, this case isn't, it's lawyers and governments and cities and all this stuff, but it's all about, the case comes down to just Dick Heller, that's it. So what was it like sitting there in the front row of like, with all these justices in front of you? It's amazing. The Supreme Court uh, gallery for observers is not much bigger than this inner area. Of it's very small. It's inner barrier. Unexpectedly. Very small. And with, it was full of people, and you could hear your heart beat. It was like being in a, in a quiet room, if, if, if you're familiar with that. Yeah. And if a mouse ran across the floor, you would have heard it. So it you, was you sat that in that front? Quiet. You sat at that front table looking up at the Supreme Court justices. Well, the other thing is it was so quiet. How quiet was it other than the mouse? It was so quiet, total silence, and then the uh, court clerk smashes a gavel and says, oh, yay, oh, yay, and it got quiet again, and then there was the strangest noise I'd never heard before, and the justices were coming through the curtain opening up, and the noise was the swishing of their robes as they climbed the four steps wow. to the bench. That's how quiet it was. Also, that's This was so a solemn cool. moment. That's very cool. I mean, and you're like, oh, here they come. What, do, what is that noise? And you're looking for it. And then while you're sitting there, were you thinking, well, as, uh, as you all know, but I think we forget, um, is that the Supreme Court hears a case and then doesn't make a decision for many, many months later. But when you were sitting in that courtroom, were you thinking, I can't believe I started this 20 years ago, and here, here we are at, in the Supreme Court with the swishing robes? I said, it's, 
it's not the victory, it's the journey. 20 years of journey. Maybe it was 30, 35 years, 76 to 19, uh, 2006, right. uh, whatever yeah, that is. That, is that 40 years, 30 years? Uh, we'll ask someone. 40 years. <laughs> this is, I'm not a math major. Um, then what was, what was impressive also was the night before, people were lined up to sleep on the sidewalk overnight. Wow. And I lived one block from the corner of the Supreme Court building. So I strolled over on my bicycle <laughs> and uh, I said- He's so normal, right? Oh, shucks, guys, what are y'all doing here? What's going on? And they were telling me, oh man, this is the greatest thing since, uh, since the greatest gun decision that's ever, that's ever happened. Century, at least and, and we're just so excited to be here. And, and like, they were jumping up and down and I was like, yeah, okay, cool. And they and, didn't uh, recognize you? Of course not. <laughs> my, I was very unpublic. So, but it was March the 18th and it was very cold in Washington as the sun goes down and they're preparing to sleep on the concrete. Wow. So I went down to the local drugstore and I got two great big bags of cough drops, 200 each. And I went down the line and passed them out to everybody and I said, oh, you'll need these. And they said, oh, thank you very much, thank you very much. And I met a couple. This is the sweetest story. Did you guys just catch that? I met, you went out and gave cough drops so they wouldn't get sick overnight waiting for yeah, your case? Like every, there was about four cough drops per hand that was held out. I've never heard this before. So I met an, a, a couple, a Dave and Colleen Lawson, and she, was the first, she had the first smartphone I'd ever seen, and she was telling me all about it. And so we became real good friends real fast. And the next day when the line was up ready to go into the Supreme Court. I went down the line and I shook everybody's hands and I said, hi, I'm Dick Heller, thanks for coming. And when I got to them, you know, I mean, a lot of people that met me the night before said, oh, you're the guy. Short story, Dave and Colleen talked about it and they said, they went back to Chicago and they said, that Dick Heller is such a normal dude if he can do what he did, see, they think it was all me, all by myself, but it was a battery of but lawyers it, always, and a it's, team. But it's always, it's, it was one man. It was one man it was, sitting in that, ca okay. in that courthouse <laughs> with okay. a lot of fancy lawyers, but yeah, there's right. one man okay. at the bottom of it. So they said, that Dick Heller, he is such a normal, ordinary dude. If he can do that, we can do that. Dave and Colleen Lawson put together the Otis and Laura McDonald case, Chicago, D McDonald versus Chicago. And just so everybody understands, and this is just a little bit of constitutional history, when the Heller decision was made in 2008, it said, Justice Scalia wrote, and it was a majority opinion, that the individual right to keep arms, to own an arm at home, cannot be infringed. So there was a lot of confusion, a confusion in the court cases up until then, whether it belonged to the militia, when you read that other segment. And I suggest highly reading the Heller decision. It's so readable. It's not boring legal stuff at all. It's really interesting. And not that it wouldn't be interesting, Dick, of course, even if it was born legal. But it's really easy to read. It's not unapproachable. But it said, but the problem was, overall for the country, is it only applied, D.C. is not a state, thank goodness. D.C. is not a state, so it only applied to D.C. And so what he's talking about is when this couple went to Chicago and started a new lawsuit, two years later, Supreme Court, based on the Heller decision, made it for the entire country that we will always have the right to have a problem. Yes. What I think was, what's fascinating is that 15 minutes after Justice Scalia said, ah, we are not here to erase the Second Amendment, the lawsuit was filed in the city of Chicago that same day. And then that started the ball, kept the ball rolling. Um, those of you who are aware know that the battles on gun control constitutional issues of gun control are not over. Dick and I <laughs> complain all the time about DC putting this crazy registration system. We still have to go to the government every time we want to buy a gun. They have to know about our guns. Um, there's a lot of fight, more to fight. But this is our time to look back and say that it was the first time the United States government, through the Supreme Court, ruled that we as individuals have a natural God-given right to defend ourselves in our home. And Dick, what what have you seen in the in the ten years since that how this has impacted our country and impacted our understanding of what one person can do if the Constitution and our rights are not being adhered to? After Justice Scalia said it is a constitutional enumerated individual right, I was shocked 
a couple of years later to find that there were 75 other law cases, lawsuits that had been brought in states throughout the country. And now, if you do the count, I'm shocked to find out it's nearly, maybe more than 300 gun cases have been filed to defend our Second Amendment right. And right now, there is a case in Hawaii called Fisher versus Kolia um, for challenging the total uh, gun law restrictions in Hawaii, which will cause a conflict with some other Supreme Courts, uh, some other appellate court cases. So we might see another decision coming down in a few years. The fight for the Constitution and what we're talking about, and to be clear, what both of us are talking about, what Dick Heller valiantly fought for and continues to to this day, the 10 years, has, he just keeps fighting on every other issue, is about our constitutional rights of law-abiding people to defend ourselves. That's what we're talking about. And he will continue to fight, I know, on so many fronts, which what you hope to see in your lifetime is, the, the, what would you like to see of the Second Amendment recognized? When I started becoming aware, I, I had a mantra. I said, in a totally free country, you do not need permission from the government to defend your life and own a firearm. <laughs> Other, ten a fellow walked into my office. I'm a, I'm a policeman full time. And a fellow walked into my office and I looked at it. Uh, I said, oh, you're from Florida or someplace, some constitutional carry state, which means you don't need any government interaction to own a firearm. I said, oh, you're from, let's say it's Arizona. You're from Arizona. I said, you have constitutional carry there. His response was, well, why would you want a piece of paper from the government to own a firearm? And I think that's it. <laughs> that was beautiful. <laughs> Thank you, Dick Keller, for everything you okay. did, for showing us how one American, any one of us, that's can cute. fight for our individual rights, can take it all the way, and when our government oversteps our rights, our constitutional rights, our individual rights, one man can make a difference. One person out there, every single one of you can do something, and it'll build a ladder. Keep it up. Love it. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Mm. Woohoo! Hello there. Thank, thank you all for coming out. Is this not the best CPAC ever? <laughs> all right. Well, let's get started after our last panel. Uh, I think Emma uh, and um, Dick set it up quite nicely uh, for us. Um, I'm actually going to go to um, to Graham Graham Hill. Uh, first, before we ask him some questions, let me tell you who he is. Graham was born and raised hunting and shooting in Texas. I said Texas. <laughs> Where he remains a very active hunter and shooter with his three boys and his wife. He's an active shooting sports competitor in three gun, IDPA, and sporting clays. Awesome. He's a managing partner of the law firm Ice Miller's DC office and CEO of Ice Miller Strategies. He's held several positions in Congress, and he served in the Bush administration as well. Please welcome Graham Hill. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, I'm going to introduce everybody. Um, Carrie Lightfoot, lovely Carrie, is the founder and owner of the Well-Armed Woman, the largest and most trusted woman shooter resource and product company. Carrie is also the founder and chairwoman of the board of the Well-Armed Women Sh Shooting Chapters, the nation's largest nonprofit women shooting organization with 380 chapters in 49 states, folks. Woohoo! That's a lot of estrogen. Carrie <laughs> yeah. is a consultant to the firearms industry, an author, a very, very popular national speaker, and frequent guest in national media. Please give a warm welcome to Carrie Lightfoot. My, car, my partner in crime right here to my left is uh, Willis Lee, retired Army Lieutenant Colonel. Willis is the president of the National Federation of Republican Assemblies. 
Willis is the co-chairman of the Trump-Pence Second Amendment Coalition, former Republican Party state chairman and current RNC member, a founder of the RNC Conservative Caucus. Lee is a retired Army Airborne Ranger, Armor Combat Veteran, U.S. Military Academy at West Point graduate with degrees. <laughs> I, read, I read that too fast, didn't I? <laughs> Engineering and public administration. Willis, and I think this is what he, with his, by the way, I had to cut his bio. <laughs> it's a lot more than this. <laughs> but uh, of all his accomplishments, I think Willis is most proud of his wife and his church, our Savior Youth Lutheran Church in Virginia. Welcome, Willis Lee. Thank you. All right, Grant, let's get started with you. Um, I think uh, Emma and Dick did a wonderful job, and I, but I was particularly interested that they said that the Heller decision, or Dick said that what, what they won, or Emma said, that what they won was the right to keep. But as we all know, the Second Amendment says keep and bear arms. So the important distinction. Could you talk a it little is. bit about that? Thank you very much, and thank you for having us here and having this panel. That is a very important distinction. The Heller decision had two landmark characters to it. First, it established once and for all that there is an individual right protected in the Constitution. That had been unsettled previously. But the facts of the case that Dick and Emily discussed were to, can you own your own gun in your home for self-defense? And the court said yes. That leaves open a huge range of practical activities that we all associate with the Second Amendment. They make enjoying the Second Amendment, exercising that freedom practical. Those were left undecided by Heller. And in the time since then, what we've seen is state legislatures have decided to fill out that larger meaning of Heller. In conservative states like Texas, where I'm from, those practical associated activities are very robust and you enjoy great Second Amendment freedoms. But if you're in California or Illinois or Maryland or New York, those state legislatures are defining those associated activities very narrowly. In fact, just this week on Tuesday, the uh, Supreme Court denied review of a case out of California that the Ninth Circuit uh, held that restricts your Second Amendment rights. Yesterday, the Second Circuit, just yesterday, uh, upheld a New York City law that says if I have a permit in New York City to uh, per what's called a premises p a permit, I can't take my pistol to Westchester County to arrange and bring it back into the city. The Second Circuit said that doesn't violate your Second Amendment rights. They're defining that in a way that's incredibly narrow, and I would argue that's impractical. So that's the battle, if I can say it that way, that's been occurring since the Heller decision. So we all have two things we can do. We have to fight in the, second, in the legislatures, make sure we get people elected there that appreciate the size and scope of the Second Amendment, what it should really mean. Uh, that will allow people like Carrie to do the wonderful work that she does in empowering women. Uh, Willis does a tremendous amount of work uh, in those legislatures, trying to make sure they appreciate this. And we have to make sure that we get judges appointed at the federal level that respect oh, the Donald Trump is doing a pretty good job at and that, is he not? And that's happening. <laughs> yes. yeah. um, you know, really quick follow-up. Uh, so you're, you're saying the bottom line is that the, as, as important and critical as the Heller decision was, it's essentially one half of the, or one slice of the apple here, that uh, we still have to carry the ball further to make sure that the second part of the Second Amendment is ratified. Imagine that that was the First Amendment and all the protected speech you enjoyed was as long as you were in your home. Right. Think of all the other meanings of that right, what that freedom really means, that wouldn't be covered by it. So that's a way to think about what's ahead of us. And it's been said a lot, freedom is always one generation away from being gone. Absolutely. And all of you out there, this next generation, you have to fight that fight. We're here because of people that went before us, people like Willis that fought to preserve these liberties, uh, like Kerry trying to help people defend themselves. The next generation is going to have to continue that fight as well. Very good. It's Very good. It's all coming around through the states. It is. It's sneaking its way through the states. So we all have to be so active and supporting Vigilant. the local Second Amendment organizations yeah. on the ground at home because we get distracted by all the federal stuff up here. 
but the dangerous stuff's happened at the state level. Exactly. Yeah. Carrie, that's actually a nice segue to where I want to go with you. Um, you've got a powerful organization, and you know, I, I, I think about all your chapters and all these women learning how to uh, keep and, and, and bear arms and mm -hmm. be proficient and, and be professional uh, <clears throat> with it, you know, and um, I think of the contrast when I think of you and I think of your organization and all these women out there learning how to shoot and shoot accurately. I think of that in the contrast, if you will, of certain aspects of the Me Too movement and the victimology that's promoted. You know, the, the uh, French actress, um, uh, Catherine Deneur, uh, uh, criticized the Me Too movement and said that, you know, it's really promoting victimology. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your organization and the contrast, if you will, empowerment versus being a victim right. for women. <clears throat> I mean, that's who we are. We are about breaking the chains of victimhood for women and through the empowerment of their own self-protection. Because you know what, and there's women out here, women are so tired of being sexually harassed. I mean, they're tired of being assaulted. They're tired of being raped. We're tired of being murdered. You know, women, we're the prey. Women are the prey of violent crime. And so women across this country are saying, you know what, it's not me. I will not be a victim again or ever. And yes, yeah. never. And so I get to see women kind of making that transition into their own self-protector because women have historically been the protected gender, right? It's either the men in our worlds or law enforcement. We already know of the failures in, in, in counting on our government and local services to protect us. They can't do it. We have to be our own first responders. So through educating and equipping and empowering women into that role, they are taking their lives back. You know, we have women 18 to 92 in our organization. Do you know how awesome it is to see an, a, a 90 year old woman take her life back? To be able to, mm -hmm. to feel like she can go to the store if she needs to? You know, because as you know, I said earlier that women are the prey of violent crime and we kind of are born with that target on our back. You know, there's that disparity of force. We're, right. Typically we're smaller and weaker. And so as we age, that target gets bigger and bigger and bigger. You know, so to be able to assist women in, in, into taking that life back, right, and shrinking that target, it, it's a remarkable thing to see. And I see women liberated from that bondage of fear every day. And it's an absolutely, it's an absolutely beautiful thing. I bless you for what you're doing and with your yeah. chapters oh, all the across the country. You. You're not only helping women to defend themselves, I get the feeling uh, that men might behave a little bit better knowing how well <laughs> our women are. <laughs> you know, it changes them. <laughs> women are really changed by it, just that confidence. You know, and I, and I teach the women in our organization, you know, it's about their confidence. Right. And when a woman's confidence grows and they go, you know what, I got this, I'm good. I can, I can take care of myself no matter what comes my way, it changes everything. It changes how they relate to people, changes how they relate to bosses and work and how they walk through a parking lot. So it's really, it's really a beautiful thing and it's a really significant thing and women, right, we're tired of it. No more abuse, no more <laughs> violence. Take it back. Well, of course, the, um, the elephant in the room is the uh, horrific tragedy that occurred in Florida and of course before that in my hometown of Las Vegas uh, and any human life, uh, innocent human life that is lost is a, is a terrible, terrible tragedy. Um, but reality is those, those precious lives that were lost in Florida and Vegas and Newtown and these other massacres are, are critically important but it's also critically important that precious, innocent lives are lost every day in big cities like Chicago, Baltimore, Philadelphia, in all these areas where they have the strictest, most repressive gun prohibitionist, gun control laws in the nation. Mm -hmm. People are more vulnerable, decent people, law-abiding people are vulnerable to crime. Criminals don't pay attention to gun laws decent people do. And Willis, you spend uh, an awful lot of time um, with legislatures all across the country in the red states and with the blue states. Can you tell us, practically speaking, uh, 
how the Heller, de sister, Heller uh, decision has manifested itself, particularly in uh, blue cities and states. Thanks, Niger. I, I spend a lot of time, <clears throat> and excuse me, working specifically in blue states. That may explain some of the gray hair. Uh, <laughs> we've lost a lot more fights than we've won, but generally the blue states tried to just ignore the Heller decision and the follow-on McDonald decision, and that's been their track so far, forcing us, law-abiding citizens, to try to move the process through the courts. You know, the blue states are getting more blue. They're each trying to outdo each other to see who can put, put the most onerous anti-gun, anti-civil rights laws into effect and hoping they can push that through. Now, fortunately, and with some of the, in some of these states, I have to work with Democrats, not Republicans, because the Democrats are all we have to work with to stop a lot of these very ugly bills. But the bottom line is, as America, as we become more separated between red and blue, states, cities, municipalities, we're, we're going to see more of this until we speak our voice. 120 million gun owners, 120 million voices that have a vote have to make our desires known to support our Second Amendment. Now is not the time for complacency. Well, I, you know, I got a question the other day, and, and this is, and you'll all get this, because you know I do work with the NRA. Somebody said, why does the NRA keep sending me all those fundraising emails? They're acting like it's always a crisis. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That was my response. In my lifetime, it always has been a crisis. They've tried to absolutely ban handguns three times just since I've been around. They're still on this track right now of trying to ban semi-automatic rifles. It, it, tell me a time when there's not a crisis. That's just one example, but yes, they're always going to come because it's not about guns. This is about control. Yeah, yeah actually, I want to uh, dovetail on that, you know, because I was, was going to say something really controversial, which is that the Second Amendment has nothing to do with guns which sounds counterintuitive, right? But it does not. I mean, guns, of course, are, are a part of it. But be it a gun, be it a knife, be it a billy club, be it martial arts, what the Second Amendment is about is the fundamental God-given right of self-defense. Amen. Protecting yourself, protecting your family, protecting your community. That's what this is about. And that's what these liberals that are progressives or whatever they call themselves, they're really quite frankly social democrats, maybe even communists, but, uh, <laughs> but that's what they're trying to go after. So how dare they righteously point their fingers at us? We are on the right side, ladies and gentlemen. As you go back, to your schools, your campuses, your communities, you go back with a stern backside knowing that you are on the right side of our Constitution, you're on the right side of history, and the right side of God. Mm -hmm. Willis, with this um, terrible, con uh, terrible, terrible situation in Florida, of course the president was here yesterday, gave a a kick butt speech and he said that you know unlike the politicians that are just going to point fingers of blame and say yo we got to put the NRA out of business and all that, all that kind of nonsense uh, that he's going to actually do something and uh, one of the things that 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 many of us uh, within the, the movement have been talking about is the number of retired policemen the number of ex uh, veterans uh, that uh, would love the opportunity to protect children in our schools um, what, what, do you, what do you think about that idea? Well, first of all, let me, let, me, let me start with describing the president's speech as kick butt. Yeah, is that, was that a good description? Yeah. All right. it, was a all P, right. it was a PG version. Yeah. All right, I'm on that. Um, look, look, I don't know if we've done this because I'm in and out of rooms already. Folks that are associated or you've been with law enforcement or your first responder or your military or former military, Show of hands, just right now, those of us in the room. Mm -hmm. Because I'm going to be talking, thank you, thank you. Thank you. I'm talking to everybody and, and including whatever viewing audience we have, but I'll be talking about you. 
uh, and that's why I just thought we ought, to, we ought to point you out. I am the president of the National Republican Assemblies, and so I do believe we should protect our children, all of our babies. And beginning at the start of this, I'll go back to a fundamental breakdown of the family. Mm. After eight years of, of Obama, we've lost confidence in the government, and we allowed Christ to be kicked out of our schools. Yeah. Simply being allowed to carry a firearm is a deterrent. You know, the bad guys have a mission. They, they don't want to fail in whatever their mission is. They're going to go wherever it's easiest. So the goal would be to protect your facility more than the other guy. That's the whole U.S. anti-terrorism and anti-crime philosophy. Just harden your facility, the guy's going to go somewhere else because you can't stop everything. So going forward, what do we want to do? We at least want to have this discussion now whether our schools need to be more secure. Now, I'm conservative, many of you are. I think this discussion has to engage the big picture. This week, a week after the Parkland shooting, of which all of us are still emotional, we're still heartbroken, this week, Planned Parenthood murdered more babies. Wow. All right? Yep. Yep. Racist policies ban firearms from law-abiding citizens in Chicago, in Baltimore, in Detroit, and the carnage on our streets continues. So all of that has to be part of this discussion they want. But in the big picture, do I believe that we can have soldiers, law enforcement operators, who are trained and experienced, help to secure our schools? Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Graham, I'm going to get you back in here. Um, this is a follow-up to my first question. Um, what are the consequences of the Supreme Court not taking up the case of fulfilling that second part of the Second Amendment and, and reigning in these federal courts so that, uh, you know, that, that are often upholding the state legislature's laws that are really gun pro prohibitionist in, in, in nature? That's a good point, because the purpose of the Supreme Court is to police the legislatures on the Bill of Rights. Uh, ordinarily, on a sec First Amendment issue, for example, if a state passed a law that violated it, the Supreme Court would intervene and say, you can't do that. But since the McDonald ruling, which was the one that made Heller applicable to the states, the Supreme Court has had almost three dozen Fourth Amendment cases and about two dozen First Amendment cases, but zero Second Amendment cases, leaving that field open for the states. What we need is the Supreme Court to establish, build out that jurisprudence around the Second Amendment, those practical activities. Can I go to a gun range? Can I take my boy hunting in Texas with an AR to shoot hogs? What things can I do and what things can I not do? And until that happens, we're going to have a balkanized rules. It's going to be one way in California, one way in Texas. We don't have that for due process. You have the same rights if you're arrested in Texas as you do in California. Well, the First Amendment is the same thing. So the consequences are bad. The second series of consequences, in my opinion, are more long term. If we as a country can decide that some rights are unfavorable at a particular point in time and limit them, mm -hmm. there's not a restraint on that same thing happening 50, 100 years from now, 10 years from now, on another right. We've seen that in our history already when it comes to race, when it comes to gender, and how rights are used. These rights are there to protect, for example, in the First Amendment, it's not there to protect popular speech, it's there to protect unpopular speech. When things become unpopular, and there's a big group saying, no, we don't want that anymore, that's exactly when the right is there to stop it. That can happen in the Second Amendment, can happen to others. So people and the courts disregarding the significance of that individual right has implications for the longevity of freedom in this country. I don't think it's limited now. You learn that lesson, and later it's applied to other things. And what I'm interested in is what does this country look like a hundred years from now. I care right now too for my kids and their grandkids, but 150 years ago somebody cared about what this country looked like now. And we need to care about what it looks like 
down the road. Yes. And that means protecting these rights. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, Willis, you had a question? Graham, let me add, did, was, was it unusual for recently Justice Thomas to come out publicly to chastise his peers for not accepting more cases that involve the second? He has, Justice Thomas and the Jackson dissent and the Sylvester dissent that was just released Tuesday uh, has, and I encourage anybody to read it, as Emily said earlier about the Heller decision, it's eminently readable, uh, has a long discussion of the question of disfavored rights. And he's pointed out, if a state had a 10-day wait period on an abortion, he thinks that case would get cert like that. But if it's a 10-day wait on a handgun, which is what they just dealt with on the case in the Sylvester California. case, you can't get a cert review on it. Uh, he has a very articulate uh, narrative in there about pointing out that we're not treating this right the way we do every other right, and that's a problem for us. It is a problem. You know, we're wrapping up uh, this panel, and um, Carrie, this question is coming to you. Obviously, we're talking about the future of the Second Amendment, but really, you know, I think uh, I know my father, may he rest in heaven, uh, Royanus, the great Royanus, uh, said to me, for, thank you. We got some people who remember. Thanks. <laughs> said to me uh, many, many years ago that, you know, the Bill of Rights are an insurance policy for us. And um, quite frankly, they all, of all of the Bill of Rights, all nine of the Bill of Rights rest on the Second Amendment. Because if the Second Amendment goes away, the other ones will go away eventually as well, the domino effect. So, Carrie, when we talk about the future of the Second Amendment, we're really, really talking about the future of the country. And I'm gonna ask you, I'm gonna uh, be uh, gender partisan here and say, um, does the future of the Second Amendment and our country really rest on women uh, and is, are they the critical demographic uh, if we win women empower women mm -hmm. let them know that this is about protection and not about aggressive uh, violence this is about right. protection protecting the family protecting themselves yeah. uh, from being victims and empower them can we can we win this thing Boy, I tell you what when it, when we get women together on a cause ladies out there what happens when you're put on a task you get it done <laughs> and you get it done with passion, right? Seriously, I think when, when we can unleash the voice of the female gun owner and their passionate stories, it's a game changer. And you know what? The media knows that. They, they're afraid of that. Uh, we just did an interview with 60 Minutes and I brought six women with me for a full day of interviewing. Full day. Not a second of it was aired. These women, this was on national reciprocity. This was the CBS a week or two ago. They were afraid of it. We were so articulate and responsible and passionate. And normal. And normal. And just like normal. normal. Yes. <laughs> yeah. they, they, they couldn't show it because it, it was the wrong message, not what they wanted to show. So um, I do think it's important. And I think we have to counter the efforts by groups like Moms Demand or Every Town, I don't know, whatever they're called now whatever Bloomberg's calling, calling, that, Bloomberg calling it now, group, whatever. Yeah. Um, their messaging is that women with guns is dangerous. You're going to get hurt with it. You, poor, you know, you're not strong <laughs> more, enough. More, you more, you more can't handle that. Yeah. And I tell you what, that's because they're afraid of us too. Yeah. They know the power of the woman's voice and our activism. And so they're, they're, they're shackling us to that bondage of fear yeah. and to victimhood. What kind of women's rights is that? What kind of equalism? You know, that's not equality. I mean, we can be equal about deciding. We can, we can be equal in the corporate world. We can be a, the president of the United States. And we can have choice over our bodies and what happens to it. Well, I want the choice over what happens to my body so I can defend it. That's right. So anyway, ladies, get out, you know, call to action. Take someone shooting. It doesn't have to be a woman. Take many, someone I'm, I'm shooting. Curious. That's my call to action to you guys, all right? Yes, you're going to go shooting? Okay. Awesome. How, many, how many ladies are going to go shooting? Raise your hands. Woo! I think they all did. Outstanding. Take a friend. <laughs> Very good. Well, actually, um, I don't think, I can't think of a better way to end uh, this wonderful panel. Uh, please, ladies and gentlemen, give this wonderful panel uh, Willis, Carey, Graham, a guys. round of applause. Thank, Thank you. you all for coming. Thank and you. remember, you are on the right side and you're at the right place greatest CPAC ever.
That's it. Thank you all. God Thank bless you. you.